Chapter 8 Who Won? A few minutes after 9 a.m., two days after the election at Democratic headquarters, everyone in the room is busy counting election returns. Three men enter the room. Two are bodyguards and the third is their charge, the new Tammany Hall boss, Honest John Kelly. John Kelly was born in New York City and raised by Irish Catholic immigrant parents. He never finished high school because his father's death forced him into the responsibility of supporting his family. He started a great setting business gaining wealth of over $800,000 by 1867. His popularity rose when he became captain of his ward at the local target shooting club. Kelly was also a volunteer fireman, an amateur boxer and actor, known for his Shakespearean roles. Kelly's political career started in the 1840s when he was elected to the city's board of aldermen. A decade later he ran successfully for Congress and won by mere 18 votes. He was the only Roman Catholic in Congress at the time. He served on the powerful House Ways and Means Committee and was re-elected in 1856. Two years later, Kelly resigned his seat in Congress and then went on to win another election making him the city and county sheriff, a job that offered no wages, but garnered him a percentage of all the legal fees collected. He was a savvy businessman and real estate investor. He shared his wealth by donating large sums of his earnings to the Catholic Church and his generosity and honesty in business dealings is how he attained the nickname Honest John. Before rising to his current position, Kelly had become increasingly dissatisfied with the way Boss Tweed ran Tammany Hall. In 1868, he agreed to run for mayor on a reform Democratic ticket against Tweed's candidate, Oki Hall. After losing, the following years were difficult after his wife and three children had all died. Kelly was so rattled by the loss he went on an extended tour of Europe. He returned to New York in the fall of 1871 when press revelations of the Tweed Ring corruption and subsequent legal prosecutions were crippling Tammany as a political force. Democratic reformers who helped topple Tweed and his cohorts did not want to see Tammany Hall dismantled so they offered Kelly the leadership of the organization. In the first three years after the Boss Tweed scandals were exposed, Kelly rebuilt the powerful Democratic machine almost single-handedly. He reorganized the governing coalition of Tammany leaders who were not corrupted by the fraudulent transactions. Most importantly Kelly's repaired Tammany's reputation and the Democratic Party in New York City. His organization project was so successful it was used in other cities and small towns across the country to create Democratic machines known for their loyalties to the party. As a Catholic he understood how the Catholic Church hierarchy worked and he used the same formula to organize the party machine. Each election district of a few hundred to one thousand people would have a precinct captain or county committeeman, the same as a parish priest does in every church. These captains would report back to district leaders, like a priest reports to a bishop and the bishops to the cardinals and cardinals to the pope. Kelly's plan made sure every district issues were attended to fairly and openly. He was confident in his abilities as a leader, as a straight shooter and more organized than most, and did not like it when people questioned his sincerity. Leaving his bodyguards at the door, Kelly strolls over to John Bigelow, William Pelton and Congressman Hewitt. All three have noticed him come in, but they keep their focus on reviewing election results at the tote board. As Kelly walks up to them he taps a rolled-up newspaper against the palm of his hand. In his usual confident gruff voice he announces his presence. Good morning gentlemen. John Bigelow, somewhat annoyed, continues to review the tote board and snipes back without looking at John, good morning yourself. Where have you been hiding? Kelly stops tapping the paper and replies flatly, busy with Tammany business. Narrowing his eyes at Bigelow he asks, where's Samuel? Bigelow doesn't respond. William realizing the tenseness between them chimes in, he'll be here shortly. Noting the negative mood, Kelly decides to change the tone of the conversation with some comical sarcasm. Well I'm not at all happy with the doubtful news reports. I have a very large wager on this election. Congressman Abram Hewitt, one of the newer members of Tammany, 
puts in his two cents, I'm sure Governor Tilden has no concern with your wager, Mr. Kelly. And neither do we. At the moment, we are busy confirming results to confirm his presidency. Kelly realizing his joke has backfired places his newspaper in his side jacket pocket, then raises both of his hands, palms up in a noncommittal manner. Relax congressman, my ten thousand is on Tilden's win, not his loss. Bigelow, realizing that Kelly was only jesting to lighten the mood, relaxes his stance and replies, then your wager is safe. Kelly is inwardly grateful for Bigelow's gesture to be nice to him, these men are not angry with me, but at the situation now confronting them. He along with the rest of the Democrats across the country, believes that regardless of what some newspaper men are reporting, there is no argument. Tilden has won the election by a large majority of the popular vote. Kelly inquires, how many votes are in dispute? Hewitt explains, it is not the popular votes. He has over a 254,000 plurality. It's the electoral college count, we appear to be shy the one vote needed to claim victory. Kelly, like millions of others across the country, believes the two go hand in hand. He naively asks, if he won the popular vote by that many, then shouldn't the electoral votes confirm it? Not exactly, Bigelow replies. Curious by Bigelow's response, Kelly asks, what do you mean by not exactly? Bigelow turns back to the tote board and points at the state's count. The popular vote determines which of the candidate's electors go to Congress with certificates. Each state has differing laws pertaining to how their electors vote. You should know this being you were once a congressman yourself. Kelly doesn't argue. Yes, I understand how the popular works with the electoral. So what is all the hoopla about? We have the popular vote by 254,000. Bigelow explains, the hoopla, as you put it, concerns the differing state laws. Not all of them are bound by party loyalty to vote by way of the popular vote. After a moment of thought, Kelly replies, are you suggesting election fraud? Hewitt jumps back into the conversation. Maybe and hopefully not. We have made arrangements to send our best party leaders from the north to the south to review the returning boards of these southern states. We must secure our electors there and will need your help to organize this effort. Bigelow complains, you know as well as I that the Republicans, under Grant's authority will try anything to swindle their way to victory, Kelly nods in agreement while staring at the tote board and remarks, you know Republicans better than us having been one yourself in the past. During their exchange Samuel enters the room and pauses for a moment and looks at the two burly Tammany Hall guards. He gives them a nod, then moves forward to where Kelly, Hewitt, William and Bigelow are gathered. Samuel is in good spirits, regardless of the situation. He reaches out to shake Kelly's hand. Honest John, it's good to see you. You missed a fantastic party last night. Kelly's response is more serious than Samuel expects. Kelly turns and points to the tote board. Do you know any of these state leaders in the South? Are they trustworthy? Samuel looks at the board. Hmm, yes the southern states. He looks back to Kelly. Our friends in Louisiana need our moral support. And my personal endorsement. Bayard, Thurman, Barnum, Randall, McDonald Dorsheimer, Carand, and a group of others are on their way to New Orleans as we speak. A strong demonstration there will defeat the designs of the returning board. John calculates in his head Samuel's detailed response and does not waver because he knows everyone Samuel is talking about. Kelly asks, What about Florida? Samuel answers, Being handled, I know every detail of the plan. Henry Watterson will go to Florida with Beck and McHenry. They've already requested funds for reinforcements to resist the radical pranks expected. Coyle and a few others are heading down to South Carolina. The corrupt zealots of the Republican Party may attempt to count me out, but I don't think the better class of the Republicans will permit it. Don't worry, we will prevail. Kelly responds, it's good to hear you are confident but, Samuel not in his usual calm demeanor raises his voice and interrupts honest John, no buts. 
I won this election fairly by over 250,000 popular votes. I am only lacking one vote in the electoral which will secure my presidency. Kelly's facial features and tone become serious. He warns, trust no one. The stakes for this presidency are high and your reform tactics, honorable as they are, have gained you many political enemies. Samuel replies, I was made aware before being elected governor of the enemies within my own party while going after corruption in both the Canal and Tammany rings. I haven't forgotten those who spewed hate at me. Samuel pauses for a moment before getting back on topic and says, even with the states currently under Republican control and reconstruction, I still need only one elector, he raises a finger to emphasize his point, of the 19 electoral votes from these three disputed states to win one or more will give me the win. Now, not being a gambler such as yourself, even you must admit, those are excellent odds. President General Ulysses Simpson Grant, the current two-term president of America resides at the White House. Born April 22, 1822 he has a previous history of failure at every business he ever tried, including farming. Only his career as an army soldier, followed by his rise to the presidency, marked the only true positive accomplishments in his life. But even these successes were riddled with poor policies and a poorer personal reputation. His administration is seen by many as corrupt with a quid pro quo cronyism. During his time in the military, Grant was quickly elevated to the rank of general in the Union Army, and he succeeded in getting General Lee to surrender the South during the bloody Civil War. After the war, a thankful President Lincoln appointed Grant. Commander of all the U.S. armies, complete with the rank of lieutenant general, a rank only George Washington had held before. In 1868, Grant accepted the Republican presidential nomination and campaigned using the slogan, Let us have peace. Once in office, Grant did everything in his power to unite the South and the North, including dealing with the Ku Klux Klan, the white supremacist group. Grant also met with notable Native American Indian tribal leaders in order to develop peace policies between their respective nations. He also took steps to repair the damaged economy during his two terms, but his good intentions were derailed by his own corrupt administration. One of the financial scandals that scarred his presidency was Black Friday, September 24, 1869 when the U.S. gold market collapsed. After his rise to the presidency, and during his two terms in the White House, Julia Dent, his wife and first lady, enjoyed extravagantly entertaining dignitaries worldwide and living in style. She dreaded the thought of leaving the lifestyle she'd grown accustomed to while positioned in society as America's first lady for the past eight years. During the disputed election she busied herself by making plans for her and Grant to travel the world once his term was over. She is convinced that her husband's memoirs will be a valuable asset for their financial future. And although Grant doesn't yet know it, Julia arranged for her husband to meet with Mark Twain so he could write them. At present, just outside the White House, large crowds of Hayes and Tilden supporters are marching, holding up political signs in support of their candidates. Horse carriages with their drivers fill the streets. From inside the Oval Office, President Grant sees the crowds through the window. Just having returned from a visit at the centennial event in Pennsylvania, Grant lights a cigar and takes a few moments to watch the political supporters as they march. After a short time, he walks back to his desk and sits down. While he was away, he was not aware of or let in on the scheme that his fellow Republicans had in mind to steal the election. He was secure in his belief that Tilden had won the presidency and was now trying to comprehend the motive as to why his Secretary of War was diverting troops to South Carolina without his authority. With these thoughts running through his mind, he calls his personal assistant Orville Babcock into the office. Grant is suspicious and not exactly sure what his party is plotting or concealing from him, but he knows he does not want to be responsible for their actions. His goal before leaving office is to do what is necessary to keep the peace in the three southern states of Louisiana, Florida and South Carolina under his command during Reconstruction. This election fiasco is the last thing he expected before leaving office to enjoy the world tours his wife Julia planned for them. 
For a brief period of time he had considered running for a third term, but dismissed the idea after finding out that he would not get the support he needed from the Republicans that had helped him in the past. Before dictating a telegram to his assistant, Grant leans back in his chair, puffs on his cigar, and directs Babcock, please read aloud that telegram just received from General Sherman. His assistant picks up the telegram from W.T. Sherman and reads it out loud, The Secretary of War Cameron has ordered me to send soldiers to Florida. Please confirm. His assistant waits a moment then says, From what I've gathered from the party leadership is that Governor Hayes' electoral count is 166 with 19 votes still undetermined. Tilden's count remains at 184. The Democrats apparently need only one of those votes to win. Through the cloud of cigar smoke, Babcock asks Grant, How do you want? Grant interrupts, One moment, I do not want to lose my train of thought. He takes a few more puffs on his cigar, slightly rocks his chair and stares blankly for a few moments. After a few minutes pass Grant dictates to Orville, Address this to General W. T. Sherman. Instruct General Auger in Louisiana, and General Ruger in Florida. Grant waits for him to finish writing. Tell them to be vigilant with the force under their command and to preserve peace and good order. He pauses for another moment then adds, see to it that the legal boards of canvassers are unmolested in the performance of their duties. Should there be any grounds of suspicion for fraudulent counting on either side, Grant looks directly at Babcock and Sternly says, it should be denounced at once. He waits for his Orville Babcock to finish writing and he says very loud, no man worthy of the office for president would be willing to hold the office if counted in or placed there by fraud. Either party can afford to be disappointed in the result, but the country cannot afford to have the results tainted by the suspicion of illegal or false returns. Orville nods in agreement and knows better than to argue with the president. He has heard from gossip within the party that a newsman, John Reed from the New York Times had started this scheme to hijack the election. He decides it would be better if the party chairman, not a news editor question the results of the election. Orville pauses for a moment and watches as Grant rises from his chair and walks around to the front of his desk, still puffing on his cigar. Grant looks at Orville Square in the eyes and says, tell them to keep it honest and to make sure the colored men of the South are treated with respect. In Ohio a large and unruly crowd of Hayes and Tilden supporters have gathered in front of the Hayes estate. Several reporters wait with them for Hayes to come outside to speak with them. A smaller group of Tilden supporters argue with Hayes supporters, suggesting rather forcefully that Hayes should get it over with and concede the election. A Tilden man bickers with a Hayes campaigner and angrily shouts, Tilden's won this election. Hayes should back off. A Hayes man fires back, Tilden ain't won nothing yet. The votes ain't all counted. A Tilden supporter fires back. You're a horse's ass, the votes have been counted, Tilden won by over 254,000 votes and he takes a swing at the man he's arguing with. The two wrestle each other to the ground and the crowd gathers around them. The reporters move in closer and one reporter says to another, this kind of action will sell thousands of papers. While the melee commences outside, inside the mansion Hayes and his wife Lucy are seated at the dining room table having lunch with two of their children. Fanny their nine-year-old daughter and Scott their five-year-old son are with them at the table. They hear the commotion erupting outside and Hayes tries his best to ignore it but Lucy won't let him. These people say you are the president, she blurts out to him. Fanny not wanting to be left out of the conversation asks her father. Is it true? Are you the president? Scott protesting asks, do we have to move? I don't want to move from here. Hayes, trying to calm his annoyed wife and children loses his patience and grumbles, Please finish your lunch. Lucy, realizing he is annoyed by the outbursts, reprimands her children. Mind your father. Both children know better than to argue with either of their parents and start to eat again. But after a moment they are disrupted when they hear someone outside shout, We'll fight, till the end for you governor. Then another demands, Come outside and talk to us. 
Hayes realizes his frustration heightening has nothing to do with his children. He calms himself and affectionately pats his son on the head. He senses his wife's fears and pulls his chair away from the table, stands and walks toward the front door, turns and sees Scott trailing right behind him. Hayes stops, points his finger and firmly tells Scott, back to the table young man and finish your lunch. Lucy decides the best solution is to distract Scott and she gently takes him by his hand to lead him, come with me. I have something special for you. Scott looks up at his mother not sure what she has as they walk toward the kitchen. I have fresh baked cookies, would you like one? Scott eagerly nods his head yes and stops complaining after her offer. Fanny, who is still seated at the table eating her lunch, pushes back her chair and chases Scott after he naughtily sticks his tongue out at her. You've been tricked, she blurts out. Lucy turns and scolds, Fanny, you're not helping. Now outside, Hayes walks down the horse and carriage path toward the front gates. His supporters cheer him while the Tilden supporters are rude and jeer. Arriving at the gate, he holds up his hands for silence from the crowd. It takes about a minute and they finally settle down. Loudly, so they can all hear, Hayes states, Friends, if you will keep order for me half a minute, I will say all that is proper to say at this time. The crowd quiets to a whispering hush and he waits until there is silence for him to continue speaking. The reporters and illustrators ready scribble on their paper pads. After a moment, Hayes begins his announcement. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. In a very close political contest, it is impossible at so early a time to obtain a result. The telegram communications from some of the southern and western states are still incomplete. He is interrupted when one of his over-exuberant supporters shouts out, Hayes is elected. More cheers and jeers fill the air. Hayes again holds up his hands up for silence. The crowd quiets down. I accept your call as a desire on your part for the success of the Republican Party. If it should not be successful, however, I shall surely have the pleasure of living for the next year and a half among some of my most ardent and enthusiastic friends, as you have demonstrated here today. The Hay supporters cheer again and this time the Tilden supporters remain respectfully quiet. Hayes waves to the crowd, turns and walks back up the path toward his home. In New York City, Samuel is seated at his office desk reading the Thanksgiving Day proclamation he has just finished adding his finals edits to. It is still his duty as governor of New York to have it signed and ready for the media by the 9th of November. He reads silently to himself, proclamation by Governor Tilden, the unfailing mercies of God of which another year has given witness, call us to renew our acknowledgement of him in thanksgiving and prayer. We are specially reminded of his protection, in the absence of any great disaster or calamity throughout the commonwealth, and of his bounty, in the large and generous returns of nature. Let us rejoice in the spirit of order and of charity and of the hopefulness which has pervaded all classes under the depression in the industries and trade, and in the growth of the public sentiment toward wise and humane methods of dealing with want and suffering. Let us give thanks for the maintenance of our social and religious institutions in their integrity, and improve the divine blessing upon all efforts in behalf of good government and a true morality. In common with the people of the other states of the Union, we recall, at this time, the blessings which we hold by inheritance. It becomes us, with them, to gratefully and humbly acknowledge the God of our fathers, whose mercies have been from generation to generation, beseeching him for the continuous of his favor to the nation of his planting, that he may not deliver our glory unto another. I do, therefore, set apart and appoint Thursday the thirtieth day of November, recommending to the people that on that day they put aside their usual employments, and in their homes and in their respective places of worship, render thanks to Almighty God for His mercies to us as individuals and as a state. Done at the capital, in the city of Albany, this sixth day of November, in the year of our Lord 1876. Satisfied with the proclamation, he takes a pen and signs it. Just as Samuel is signing his name, his best friend campaign manager and Gramercy neighbor John Bigelow enters the room. Samuel pushes his chair back and stands. 
he has a broad smile on his face. John, please come in. He suggests to Samuel, if you have time I'd like us to take your carriage and ride through Central Park. Samuel likes John's surprise invitation and nods his approval. Sounds like a terrific idea. He walks toward Bigelow grips his friend by the arm. A quick glance out the window Samuel sees John's carriage and horses parked with people standing close by out front. John smiles, I had your smaller carriage moved to the back a few hours ago. This way no one will follow us when we leave. Samuel says, clever. Then adds, a spirited ride will clear my head. Releasing John's arm, Samuel takes the proclamation from his desk, walks over to Mr. Smith who is seated at his desk and hands it to him, this is signed and ready to go. Samuel sees a few daily newspapers on Smith's desk. He picks them up and says to John, I'm ready. Samuel walks over to a coat rack, grabs his coat. Says to Mr. Smith, see you later, a catchy idiom he came up with everyone liked. John and Samuel walk toward the back of the house. Mary sees them and asks. Where are you off to? Before they can answer she scolds, you'll catch cold dressed like that. Samuel reaches over and gives Mary a kiss on her cheek. Frowning, Mary motions with her eyes at the butler standing off to the side. Without a word, the butler walks to the coat rack and retrieves a hat and scarf and brings them to Mary. She turns, hands them to Samuel and says, humor me. Samuel knows better than to argue with her. He rolls his eyes and takes the items from her and walks toward John who is waiting at the door. A short while later Samuel is driving both his horses holding the reins loosely and maneuvers the team at a steady trot pace with other carriage traffic. He and John are enjoying the needed break from campaign affairs on this gorgeous day, the air has a chill, the sun is shining and there's hardly a cloud in the sky. Samuel as famous as he is not recognized by people which pleases both men during their outing. Samuel steers the horses into Central Park. The sweeping meadows and a large lake complete the countrified landscape called Central Park. Odd-shaped rocks decorate the nature trails and walkways. The horse paths are lined with hundreds of young trees, shrubs and plants that have already gone into hibernation for the winter months. New Yorkers are delighted with the 843 acres park nestled in the middle of their growing concrete metropolis and enjoy it with their families and friends during all four seasons. Samuel once inside the park picks up the pace of his horses and John Bigelow holds a firm grip with his right hand trying not to get bounced off the carriage. The scarf Mary gave Samuel to wear is tied loosely around his neck and the hat he is supposed to be wearing to prevent head colds is resting on the seat between him and John. While holding on with one hand and a newspaper in the other John Bigelow begins to read out loud. Nip and Tuck Tilden still has 184 votes to Hayes 166. 19 votes are still undecided. Samuel slaps the reins and the horses pick up more speed. Samuel asks, what else does it say? Bigelow grabs the side of the bouncy carriage tighter and complains, Samuel, you may be my closest friend, but by God man, you are making it most impossible to read and stay in my seat. Samuel lets out a huge laugh and pulls the reins back to slow the horses to a walk. Samuel grins, better? Bigelow relaxes his grip and replies, much. He straightens the newspaper and reads silently before out loud. He chuckles at something stated in the article. Samuel turns to him and says, humor me. With a smirk, Bigelow reads the article out loud. It says, Tilden's a most accomplished and astute politician, less confiding and more distrustful than Grant. A man of modest, unobtrusive personality, stooped and hence looks smaller than he is, has a small boyish face, round head bent with that sleepy droop in the left eyelid, caused by ptosis. He dresses with plainness. Unoffended, Samuel thinks the remarks are interesting. 
I like the boyish face remark but I do not think my suits are plain. Intrigued, Bigelow continues to read aloud. There is a paragraph here, Governor Marcy predicted you would be president, except for your physical stamina. Samuel now gets somewhat defensive by this last statement. Frowning, he asks, Marcy commented on my physical stamina? John answers, he claims it is like putting a 200-horsepower engine in a craft built for only a 100-horsepower. He states that you have too much mind for your body. Samuel continues to walk the horses at a slow pace then says, he actually could have said worse. After all, I certainly have of him. Both men laugh. Suddenly, and without warning, a black stallion with a beautiful woman in the saddle dressed in a very fashionable outfit races past them, spooking Samuel's horses. After the horse gallops past them at lightning speed, the woman turns in her saddle and tips her hat in apology for the upset. Samuel and John who only sees the woman for that brief encounter, estimates the woman possesses not only class and great beauty but also has remarkable riding skill. Vivacious, Samuel says thinking out loud while he steadies his horses to halt. Both men were awestruck by the woman's spirit. Her long deep brunette hair bounced off her back as she distanced herself from them. The young rider's name is Celeste Stauffer and she is from New Orleans, Louisiana. Though not an area of the country Samuel or John have frequented in the past, it is an area they are now connected to because of the election dispute in that state. Now that's a feisty female, Samuel remarks. I've never seen one ride with the skills she possesses. While watching Samuel's reaction to the surprise interruption Bigelow realizes his best friend is smitten with the young woman. He nudges Samuel's arm and interjects, she's young. Samuel elbows his friend back and says, I may be cerebral John, but I'm not blind. Recovering his thoughts and realizing that they are sitting still, Samuel snaps the reins against the horses' backs and maneuvers the team to turn toward Fifth Avenue. I do admire women that know how to handle a spirited horse. Few do. Bigelow grips the side rail again to steady himself after the horses pick up the pace and turns onto Fifth Avenue away from Central Park. Samuel says, I'll be 63 next month, I'm far past the stage in this life to be thinking about having a wife and children. My mind is currently focused on enforcing laws and ousting corruption. People who cheat, murder and enslave any race of people to enrich themselves disgust me. I know you feel the same which is why I trust you unequivocally. John touched by Samuel's words of trust in him pats Samuel gently on the back in a gesture of thanks.